Okay, well, when in doubt, go with what you know, and what you know is how to go with the acid flow. But for this particular case, let's go to the code because it'll be much easier to see there. So the data is attacker controlled, and I said you should include things like Ruby to make sure that you have the definitions. I also included some of those parsers before I realized that the definitions were in Ruby, so don't care about that. But uh, things like value, if we go to the definition, those seem to be just defined as something like an unsigned long. So just a constant size data element, a long in this case, which we know will depend on whether it's 32 or 64 bit system. Anyways, the data is acid and there's a nil check. We could go see what that's up to. And we go through and what we find is it takes that value and it checks if it's equal to exactly this and that's four. So basically there's a check for four. So the attacker can clearly set the value to something other than four and they will not go into this raising of an exception. And then they will continue on to this, this call to our string length. So attacker just has a hard coded constant value. Let's say that it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's then going to be passed in here and it seems like it's gonna be trying to treat it like a string. It seems like it's calculating some sort of Ruby string length and then casting it to an int and checking if it's non-zero. So let's see how exactly that works. Go in there, go to this, pick a definition. Okay, it seems to take that value, which it calls a string, but which right now is just literally a hard-coded constant, and it passes it into this thing, this function that does get mem, but then this must be returning some struct because it is then taking a field out of the struct, the as heap lang field of whatever struct is returned back. So we go there, and yes, indeed, it's returning a struct, a R string struct. So again, this is just a hard-coded value. Now this is where I give you a hint on the website to say, you know, just assume that this doesn't seem to do anything, that it like com uh, compiles through to just a null doing a whole bunch of nothing. Literally, if it's just the number zero, it's not having any effect on the code. But the reason why I say that it's, you know, hard is you have to care about, you know, okay, is it Ruby debug? Well, it's probably not Ruby debug, so we can go to that definition. And then we would go to this one. And this one is a little more complicated to say what's going on. So if Ruby debug, well, we don't care about that, but then we have a whole bunch of other nested ifs and else ifs and so forth. So at that point, it's not really clear whether this is gonna go through to this assert nothing, which will again do a whole bunch of nothing, or whether it's going to go through to this one. But if it goes through this one, it also seems that it's doing a whole bunch of nothing. So. Basically, for now, we're gonna just assume that does nothing and the attacker will be able to skip over that and go to the next line. Then we've got that string and it's being passed into rbflne raw. And so this has to do with some sort of Ruby flag checking and this is the particular flag that's being checked. And so we go into there and see what that does. And then we've got yet another indirection. Go to that code. Again, this is just our hard-coded number constant string thing, and this is flags. Well, that was some flag that was passed back there. Gonna go into that, and once again, more indirection. We're already assuming that this assert or assume does a whole bunch of nothing, so when we get to here, this object, which came from the string, which came from the data, which is really just a hard-coded unsigned long, as far as we can tell, that is going to be treated like something that is a pointer, at least after it comes back from our basic. So it looks like our basic does some sort of cast to a struct our basic pointer. So it's taking the hard coded value and it's turning it into a pointer. So this, and not any pointer, it's specifically saying, oh, I assume that hard-coded value is a pointer to an rbasic struct, which of course is gonna have you know, some particular definition. But no matter what it is, the fact that this object at this point is an acid pointer, it's a complete, you know, it's gonna be treated as a pointer. It's just a hard-coded constant, but as soon as you start treating it as a pointer, now it's an acid pointer. And so essentially you can point anywhere in memory. So this is gonna be a problem because you can point anywhere in memory. 
You're going to treat that memory as an R basic, which will be type confusion. And then further, you're going to pull some flags from this memory that you're going to treat as an R basic and do an AND against the flags that were passed in and return the result based on that. So that is kind of just type confusion in and of itself. And as we make our way back to here, we see that actually it gets a little bit worse because now it's going to take that acid pointer and it's going to dereference it. It's going to treat it as an R string. So again, casting, forcing it to be treated as a R string pointer, which is once again, type confusion. And then it's immediately dereferencing that. So now basically it's going to memory at this fully attacker controlled value and it is going to read from memory there. So this is an out of bound read, which is an info leak source in and of itself. So if for whatever reason, this ended up not uh, returning back true and it didn't go down this path, then it would go down this path instead. But at the end of the day, this once again has a hard coded casting of this acid value to be a R string pointer and then dereferencing it. So fundamentally the problem here is that it's taking an acid value, it's passing it to a function that's going to treat it like an R string, like a Ruby string, but it doesn't actually know that it's a Ruby string at this point. So let's go back and you know recap. We've got an acid value, which is being treated as an acid pointer being cast to a Ruby object, which is type confusion, followed by dereference, which is out of bound read and out of bound read is by definition an info leak. Now, how is that like an info leak though that's useful or in any way what we typically think about as info leaks? So I'll just go back to the original vulnerability report and I'll uh, highlight some of the things they said about how this could potentially be beneficial to an attacker. So in order to leak information about the address space in which Nokogiri is running, so again, the address space here would be you know, some process running on a server, for instance, in Ruby on Rails. An attacker can repeatedly crash the server by trying addresses until the remote server does not crash, therefore indicating that the supplied value is a valid memory address. So this is sort of like a non-standard, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think of it as the first thing, but so if you're interacting with the server and if you're able to use this acid dereference, this out of bound read, but if that is an invalid address, then it's crashing. But if it's a valid address, then it's non-crashing. Then all of a sudden you can leak some sort of information about the memory space of a completely remote server. Furthermore, if Nokugiri is being used in a way that reflects the results of the parsing back to an attacker, the vulnerability can be used to leak arbitrary Ruby strings, which may contain secrets that the attacker should not have access to. So specifically, imagine that you send an acid pointer in and it is actually a Ruby string and it is parsed fine. And then if the web application is printing that Ruby string back out, then you've just sort of leaked an arbitrary Ruby string somewhere in memory. Of course, in order to do that, the attacker has to guess the address of the target string in memory, which may not be feasible, quite frankly, probably not feasible. So I think this part right here, the info leaking about addresses being valid versus non-valid is the more interesting component of this. So what was the fix for this? Well, it is introducing an explicit check type on the data being passed in and making sure it is a string. And the advisory folks noted that this sort of check type was present in other locations and it was just missing here. So if you go into check type, you'll see that, you know, that is drilling down and making sure that it really is the Ruby type that you expect.